Hello and welcome back to another episode of the After the Time Out podcast sponsored by the IBCA. We are a global podcast that shares the passion for the coaching profession. You will hear the stories of coaches from all around the world. We are covering the profession in game, outside of the game, and anything in between. As always, thank you for listening. We look forward to sharing the coaches' stories with you. Happy New Year and welcome to the first episode of the ATO Podcast for 2024. Today we have the honor and joy to talk to Illinois Basketball Hall of Famer Steve Gores. Coach Gores is one of the most successful coaches in Illinois basketball history, winning 881 games and having only two losing seasons in his 39 years coaching, most of which he spent at Rockford Boylan High School. This episode is an absolute history lesson in Illinois basketball and a master's class in coaching. Hope you enjoy. As always, thank you for listening to the After Time Out podcast. Oh, Coach, thank you so much for joining us today. We want to start everything with the the opening tip. Um, you've had an amazing career, um, so we wanted just to fill our listeners in on your your coaching journey in basketball in Illinois. Wow, um, that's that's a great opening question. Simply because I had no idea um, until I was approximately twenty years old what I was going to do. Uh, I was the first person that, uh, that actually ended up graduating from college in my family. I'm the oldest of six. My mom and dad didn't do it. My dad only had a sixth grade education. We grew up in inner city Chicago. Um, they ran a, a printing business, which my brother uh, took over when my dad passed. One of my brothers took over and I I didn't want to be in the business and I liked playing. I I wasn't very good, but I played football, basketball, baseball, all the sports in the Gage Park area. I went to Gage Park. And what got me first involved in coaching was I had a part little part-time high school job uh, working for the park district uh, with little kids and, and directing their games, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I sort of liked that. And then uh, when I went to Chicago Teachers College and after I graduated and I was spinning my wheels and not really doing well academically, um, uh, I decided, well, a couple of my buddies and I, we pushed our draft our number up in the draft. And we went in the Army for a couple of years. And when I was in the service, I, I played a, on a service team. Uh, down to Fort Hood a little bit, and I started coaching the team a little bit that we were on, just being like the captain and working with the team. And when I got out of there, I said, you know, I'm going to go. And the girl I took to the senior prom was at Western Illinois University in Macomb, and we were riding back and forth. It was a good education school. I said, I'm going to do this. So I think my big break as far as really getting into the uh, idea that this is what I was going to do is when I got to Macomb, uh, I was a GI, I was a vet, and the, we had a strong veterans club. And the guy that was the president of our veterans club was also ran the YMCA in Macomb. And so I started working for the YMCA. And the YMCA would send, uh, send a person around to the schools to run their after-school programs. And I started doing that while I was going to school at Western. And... And and then when I graduated and I student taught a bone in Chicago and um, and I was there for the whole football season. I was actually assistant coaching a whole football season at, at Bowen. And, and and when I graduated, it was midterm and I got an offer for a grad assistantship and went to work on my master's, which I did. And then my part of that was going around to the different schools in the McDonough area working with with uh, the students and, and teaching PE classes and et cetera, et cetera. So here I was, I didn't have any type of coaching background or within my own family and nobody was really a, a successful player. And I, I was just hungry to get involved. So I would I <laughs> oh. oh, excuse me. So anyways, what happened was um, I was finished, I was starting to uh, finish up my master's and I 
And I got this job out of Bardolf, Illinois. And in uh, Bardolf, Illinois is like a quote unquote suburb of Macomb. We had 58 kids in that, in that school, 58, um, about 27 boys. I think we had uh, 19 of the 27 involved in basketball and baseball and track because I coached all three naturally. I, I that year at Bardolph, I taught history, uh, world history, U.S. history, driver's ed, uh, PE, coached uh, baseball in the fall, baseball in the spring, track in the spring, and and two levels of basketball in the winter. Uh, we were we were seven and fourteen. It's one of my one of my two one of my two losing rec uh, records in thirty nine years as head coach, and um, they had won I think. Uh, two or three games the year before I got there. It was seven wins was the most wins they had in the previous five years or something. So I, 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 we go in there at the end of the year and they're going to have a banquet at the end of this basketball season. And this was the smartest thing I ever did. The Percy Yard, the superintendent of Bardoff said, well, they're going to have a banquet. Who do you want to have come and speak? I said, well, I don't, I don't know. What do you think? He says, well, how about Red Rogers from over at Hamilton? Well, Hamilton was this, you know, a small school over in Western Illinois, and this guy had a pretty good uh, rep, and he's coached there a number of years. He was a good coach. But, you know, if you're if you're around Macomb, Illinois, you're right in between two tremendous rivals in, back then in those days in high school basketball. Galesburg, John Thiel, Quincy Cheryl Hanks. I says, look, we, we got two guys going to be in Hall of Famers. They're right here. They, um, why, why don't I try to get one of these guys to come speak at a banquet? Well, you go ahead if you, you try to do that. I got Cheryl Hanks on the phone, and he came over. And he spoke at the banquet. And it's the best banquet I've ever been at because you know what it was. It was all home cooking. It was all the, the, the farmers, you know, they, they bring everything, all this homemade food and everything right on the table. And Cheryl said, this is phenomenal, you know, all that stuff. We had a little rep, got, got something going and talked. So um, what happens is I get a, uh, uh, I, I finished my year at Bardolph, and actually I understand seven wins, I don't know squat. I got I to give you, you better than this. And uh, I, I get a, I get a full-time job and I'm, I'm still, I'm still, I hadn't finished my master's quite yet, but I go up to Crete Moni for one year. I'm at Crete Moni and I'm an assistant sophomore coach. Uh, and I, I run the, the weekend program, uh, for the basketball program, the, the grade school program on Saturdays. And I do this, I do that. I scout and I even helped coach some football. And I realized after one year there, I was putting more time and effort in than the head coach was. I was there all the time working and he, he went, I'm not going to say any names or anything. So, and, and then my, my first wife who, who, who passed away when she was 30, but my first wife was graduated from school that year when I was at Crete Moni and we both got a job, Quincy, Illinois. She, we called down there. There was, a, there, there, there was a bulletin, and, and we called down there. And she got a job at the junior high. I got a job at the high school. I got became the head sophomore coach for Cheryl Hanks. And that uh, the idea of bringing Cheryl in the bar off the year before to speak at the banquet and, and starting a relationship with him led to him being my mentor. And Cheryl and I'm, you know, to this day, I'll say the reason I. My organization skills, uh, the discipline we had in the program, our, our goals and our organization was do what I learned under Cheryl for the three years I was there. I was there 69, 70, 70, 71, 71, 72. And then we, you know, we finished second to the number one team in the country, Thornridge, uh, in 72. So uh, that was, that's how I got going. And then we, once we uh, we finished second in state, that's why I went up to Oswego for two years and took them to lead eight and Things just went crazy. Sorry for that long answer. 
No, Todd, Todd and I were over the moon excited uh, to have you on because it, it truly is. It's, it's going to be a, a really great glimpse of, of kind of the history of, of you and the history of the IHSA and the history of basketball. So kind of the first half of the episode is going to be, we love when people tell their story. So, um, you know, you kind of mentioned, you know, you didn't have too many losing seasons there, coach. You, you mentioned two, um, and you know, you had a, a winning record at basically every stop as a head coach. So, you know, we wanted to delve into, you know, you, uh, let's say there's a young head coach. We have lots of, of young coaches that listen to our show, you know, and, and it's their first year, it's their first couple of years, you know, what's kind of your advice to help them establish themselves to have kind of that success long-term. Uh, that's a great question. And uh, it, I think coaching is a little bit like uh, any other pr profession. And it's very important to network. You network, you network. And then after, after you're done networking, you network some more. Um, I've been blessed to know a lot of great uh, high school and college coaches. I mean, I coached against Alex Sadargas. I coached against, I mean, when I was a head coach at Harvard, I, uh, and Alex was at North Boone for one year. I coached, I was over there and I, I coached against him. I, um, I was on the bench against Virgil Fletcher for crying out loud in ball press, uh, in, in Southern Illinois. Uh, uh, I, Dottie Hawkins at Pekin, uh, you know, Ron Ferguson, Thornridge, you know, uh, Ernie Cavisto, Roar East. I coached against him a few times. Uh, John McDougal, the Roar West. I actually s sat down. Uh, this is the kind of coach I might, I mean, John McDougal and I were, uh, I was at Oswego. He was at Aurora West. And he beat me the, the first year I was at Oswego. Then we beat him the next year. But we sat down and talked to each other. We were friends. And we went out there. Gordy Kirkman was there, too. He was the assistant. And, and uh, we sat down, went to lunch, and we used to talk about about like defense and, and the key to defense, the key, one of the major keys to defense is you give the opponent one shot. Okay. I mean, you can bust your tail all you want, but if you're giving offensive rebounds, you're not playing defense. And, and that John McDougal seems were just great. I just gave up one shot. So I, you know, I developed, we developed some drills. I some drills I took from John and went to back to practice did that. Uh, I, I went up to, uh, I went up and, uh, Talked to Bo Ryan when he was up working in the state schools in uh, in in Wisconsin system. I went up and talked to Tony, uh, Dick Bennett, Tony's dad, who's at Virginia, and and uh, and actually Dick Bennett. Uh, I was offered uh, the the Carthage College job because of Dick Bennett, but it just wasn't the right the right time for for my family and I to do something like that. But. Uh, but it's, it's just you initiate these relationships. You go and you visit with these people. Another thing a lot of young guys do, and I, I, this is what I couldn't do that some guys still can. If you're a head coach, it's hard for you to leave and go someplace to so these all-star camps. There's big camps where they bring all these good players in and, and, they, and they have assistant coaches out there and you network with the college coaches that are out there, whatever. That that used to be the way to get to know these guys, but I couldn't do that because uh, I ran a basketball camp that was like a month long. Every summer, I was you know every place I went, and and it was like June was the camp, and then July we went and played in some tournaments, and then August I took I took three weeks off before school started. That was my vacation. I I got to go to Florida in, in first two weeks in in August. You know what I mean? And but otherwise, but otherwise, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't get, go and work in those camps very often, unless I took my team to a camp. And I, and I was another one, one, one way I got, I was pretty close to Rich Falk, God bless him, uh, from when he was at Northwestern, because we went over to uh, Lake Forest and they had a camp over there and we talked. And it just opened your mind. I sat down with Ray Meyer, you know, and Joey just passed away. And because I had Ray Meyer come out and talk at our camps and it, you just have to be open. You can't be closed minded. Uh, it's not one way. It's it's the right way. It's for, for the right way for the group you have. And another, th another thing is you're talking about for young coaches. Um, when I when we had been talking about basketball, when we had basketball camp. The custodians all got T-shirts. At Borland. 
my my camp my camp t-shirts they came in boxes of them and then we had a, over 400 kids in camp a, a couple of years and the t-shirts come in i'd go i'd go down take them down to the stores here what size bang 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 give them shirts i went down and, and secretaries wake up front they got boxes of candy gifts or whatever my wife made sure that uh mary did that that we took care of the secretaries up there went, because they helped me with typing and doing things, whatever, preparing for your end books and things, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just that you you, you got to make sure that you appreciate the people that are working around you, not just your assistant coaches, the custodians, the secretaries, the teachers. And another thing is you want to establish a, a, a rapport with the academic side of it, of this, of this school, because of the fact that Believe it or not, these these young men and women, when you, with you guys coaching girls, you're not going to school to be in the NBA or the WNBA. You're going to school to get, an, get your degree, go on and uh, and be the best you can be academically, go on to college, and hopefully maybe you'll be able to play a little bit in college, but get that college degree. And I, I and what we said when we we had when I started camp, we had kids in kindergarten. We went K through 12 in camp. We had bitty camp for one hour. We just we just had them walk around. Some some of the kids can't walk properly. And and this is the God's truth. And I learned this when back in back in Macomb when I was teaching at those grade schools. I went to a grade school and, and a little kindergarten kid was walking off with his with his feet turned in all really ugly like that. And I and I and I called the mom up and she came and I told her and she went to an orthopedic guy and she came back in tears. You know, the orthopedic guy said if he kept doing that, he had he had been permanently impaired. So, you know, it, it's so that's why we there's there's this education system. We're just not worth looking for Michael Jordan. We're looking to help children grow up and be uh, healthy, responsible adults. But but at camp, I I'm, I'm gonna cover this before I forget about it. At camp, when it got kids got to about eighth and ninth grade level, I said, "You guys are going to be coming to Boylan in a year or two if you're not coming this summer." And when I want, we want you to understand the four priorities we have in our program, and our four priorities are God, your belief in faith, and whatever whatever religion you are is fine, but your belief in faith, family, if somebody's with your family. That somebody from your family is with you the day you're born, and hopefully when you pass in this world, there's somebody with you. Education, because because of the fact that you'll be a stronger person, a more responsible person, and be able to take care of yourself if you're if you're an educated person, and then basketball. So we didn't we didn't throw this jazz. We didn't throw this stuff where basketball is so important. Your, your family comes second, and your school comes. No, no. No, God, family, education, basketball, period. But when it came to basketball, you better be ready to play. So kind of to build off that, and and Todd and I, we have a good connection with the the IBCA. Uh, they kind of sponsor us. We kind of have on their guests. Um, you know, I've I've been fortunate the last five or six years to to be a part of it in different things, voting for the Hall of Fame, et cetera. You know, your your first key there was networking, 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 and and I know you've played a huge role in the IBC and its history and its development, and and obviously that's a great way to network. Maybe just you know quickly for our guests, you know, a little bit about you know why those organizations are important, why you wanted to have a leadership role in those organizations, um, etc. Um, interesting story because it's. The first two people, the first two people of the IBCA, can you name them? I'm going to say you are one of them, and I'm going to say Chuck Rolinsky is the other. I was third. Oh, okay. First two people, Chuck Rolinsky, Cheryl Hanks. The reason I was third is because I'd go with Cheryl. I'd drive. Cheryl didn't like driving. we drive from Quincy. we drive over to Toluca. And, and, and Chuck had this great little camp, little clinic, coaching clinic over in Toluca. And if you've been down there, they got restaurant motors and corners, and we all went and ate afterwards and all that stuff. And we went a couple years up there, and Cheryl had an agenda. Chuck had an agenda. 
Chuck's agenda was he didn't like getting beat when he by and not having a chance when his school is Toluca with a couple hundred maybe or hundred and some, and he's he has to go against Peak or Lockport because I think he went to Sweet Sixteen with one year and he got beat by Lockport or something by Bob Sarge or something. So he wanted class basketball, but he was a little small fish in a small pond. So he needed somebody to help him. Okay, here's Cheryl. Cheryl is a big fit, is a shark in the ocean. He was a tough, he's an ex-Marine guy. He was a tough SOB. God bless you, Cheryl. And if, if, if Mike and Kissy are watching, I coach Mike, and I saw Kissy cheer when I was down there, and I love him like they're my own children. They, they know what I'm talking about. Great, great coach. But Cheryl was upset, and I don't I don't blame him because the fact here he had this 21 two years in a row, winning 21 or more between our between uh, 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 well mostly at, at Quincy High School, and uh, and he applied for the uh, Illinois head coaching job, and they wouldn't even give him an uh, interview. You know, here's a guy that's in, he's. He's in Quincy, Champaign, straight across, straight from state. He's thoroughly well known, and they bring they bring in. Uh, I I can't remember who they brought in, but whoever they brought in, it was only there two or three years. He was gone, but it was a guy that was I think I think it might have been a guy that was from the West Coast at that time. Uh, I can't remember, but the point was he wanted he wanted to his his idea show was. We have to have an organization to build up and, uh, and support our young coaches who are, are more than capable of becoming college coaches if that's where they want to go. So one one wanted to have an organization for, for help the coaches professionally. The other one have an organization to develop this idea to the state to have class basketball. Well, uh, you know, years later, uh, uh, we wanted, you know, I supported class basketball, two classes. Uh, there's no way in the world I support four classes. That's watering everything down. That's, you know, you know. in fact, I even told the, uh, the state when it came to a board meeting, I was, you know, years later, I was president of the association for a couple of years. And I says, you know, uh, why don't we just uh, give, out, give out 750 state championship trophies, throw the ball up and let's play. Because you know this this I this you know like poor Hampshire or poor uh, Portersville or Pitts for you I don't, you know really come on you play you play the entire year you play the entire year and every year you cannot you know it's, cannot cannot divide everything up in four classes and what why when are they going to go to eight just like football the football start with four now they're eight. Okay, basketball is four. It'll go to six. You know, if, if a couple little principals get a bunch of other principals together, so oh, we're not having a chance. That's not that's not the point of athletics. You don't you don't do that in the world of work. They don't develop three more jobs so we could take care of Tom, Dick, and Harry to get them jobs. No, Sam earned a job. He has a job. We can't create more jobs. There's only one job. So, I mean, I, I, I think that we missed the whole point behind athletics, and that is be the best you can be, work hard at it, be proud of your effort. And if you fall short, pick yourself up and start over again Let and, and reset your goals. So, Coach, I wanted to talk to you about, like, the different communities you, you coached in, right? Obviously, every community is different. Every place you go to has – different needs and, and things you got to uh, try to, to try to build up. So, um, you know, when you at your coaching stops, how did you kind of assess that for that, that community um, and, and the needs they have and what you needed to do in that community, that school to be successful? Excellent question. The, the truth of the matter is um, each community is different. For example, the first job I had, my first head job was was Bardolf. We were, you know, seven to fourteen. Uh, even that infancy of my coaching, where there was like two hundred people, maybe in a town, maybe one hundred seventy-five people in a town. 
I looked around the town and there was junk just in empty lots. There was garbage. There's just everything here, everything there just left. Now, all these kids, they were driving when they were 10, 11 years old because they're all farm kids. So uh, been there in high school now, but so they all have pickup trucks. So, and I had, and since I told you earlier, I taught so many different classes or I just bought had almost all the students, the 58. I said, this Saturday's going to be cleanup. We're going to have cleanup work Saturday. We, we picked the Saturday that was, was convenient for everybody. We went out there and we spent five or six hours, from eight o'clock to about one o'clock and with trucks and everything. And we just cleaned that, cleaned that town. We picked up garbage here and there, everywhere, and put them in trucks and took it to a dumpster or something. I don't, we I can't remember now. It's sixty years ago, and we we got rid of all that garbage. And I says, you got to have pride in the community you you live, and and the kids the kids enjoyed it. The, the parents did, and they, and they took some pride in it, just like the best banquet you could ever have be a bar of. But they took care of. You now we had that stuff there, and the, the farmers are out there taking care of their farms. The town's going to hell, and we and the people came in, and we picked up the town and made it made it look cleaner. Um, that'd be bar off. Uh, then I, uh, I was I was only a creed for a year as an assistant, so it's hard to say uh, what what we did there. But then uh, um, when I went down to Quincy, I got immersed with the uh, with a lot of different things because Quincy. Quincy uh, Sure was on uh, his own live TV show, had his radio show in the morning, and uh, we had to go around and, and, and do various various things uh, in a community, but not as much as I think I would have liked to, because the fact that since we were in Quincy and we had to travel so much uh, in a basketball season, you cannot believe how many how many miles we put on. Our closest, I mean, we're, our closest uh, conference game was Galesburg. We're in the Western Big Six. That we, Moline, uh, East Moline, Rock Island, Alleman, Galesburg, and us. Uh, I mean, there it was 120. It was like 108, 10 miles to Galesburg, 130 miles to the Quad Cities, and. And then we, and, uh, we'd go up to play Thornton on a weekend. I flew the scout from Quincy. They flew me up to Chicago to scout Thornton on a, on a Friday because the team was playing somebody that was easy on Friday night. And I had to go scout Thornton because Thornton was loaded. And, I, and then I met the bus and I, I rode the bus back after we beat Thornton that next night with a scout report. So Quincy was just a... It was like, it was like a, a D2 college program almost because of the fact that all the responsibilities you had with travel and scouting and, and planning ahead. When it got to the situation where, um, where the community involvement was when I became the head coach at Oswego and it was a little bit different because of the fact that we, when the camp brought the people, the people together and we, and, uh, and uh, when we went, when we had a big run the second year, we went to state. This, the grade school across from high school left the kids out. They, were, they, they came out to this uh, Highway 71 across from the high school. And they, the whole community, the, the whole grade school was watching the buses. We took off down to, down to lead eight. We came back when we got smacked down to lead eight. We came back Sunday. They met us, and we had a had a parade all the way from Yorkville all the way back to Oswego High School. Even though we got beaten in a tournament, um, they had never they had never won a game in a regional tournament. Never won a game in a regional tournament, and uh, we won a regional sectional and a super sectional game, and then we got beaten in Elite Eight, and and so that's brought that back. The the working in within the community, like that you think you're trying to get to, is is almost like when I went to Harvard, when I went to when when I went to I mean I went to LP in Harvard, I never really had the chance to do what I did when I went to Borland, and I think that's what you're alluding to because when I was at Borland, we did some very interesting things. 
our teams, our teams for the most part, would most part several years we'd go to Special Olympic basketball practices. We take our teams to Special Olympic basketball practices and <laughs> play with the Special Olympics, and and then every spring we would go to Special Olympics track uh, competitions, and we would we would we we would take care of uh, you know making sure that the special has gotten the right lanes and we time them and do that. We were there for five, six hours on a Saturday for special Olympics at Christmas at Christmas. We'd, we'd go, uh, well, Thanksgiving, uh, there was a few Thanksgiving. So we went to a local church and, and we fed the needy at, 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 Christmas, at Christmas, we went to the hospitals. There's three hospitals in, in, uh, in Rockford at the time. And we went to different hospitals and then we sang Christmas carols and had the team just, we, we had a practice and then we, we called ahead. They knew we were coming and uh, we gave out like passes for um, basketball games of bowling to the parents and the, and the kids that were, because we went to the pediatric wards at three hospitals. It was Christmas. So, so I, we, since I was there born in 31 years, I had more time and more effort to give everything back to the community than I did when I was just at a school for one or two years. So that leads perfectly into the next thing that, that I wanted to talk about, which was, you know, you, you kind of were at a couple different schools for a little while, and then you kind of got to boiling and, and settled in for obviously decades and, and made a lot of history there. You know, what, what about boiling for all that time, you know, made you want to stay, whether it was the, the administration's vertical alignment or the athletics or the community or, you know, what, what made Boylan that, that final place that you really settled in? I think a little bit of everything. Um, um, uh, our, our children were getting to the age of, you know, really getting involved in school and, and activities. And, uh, um, but the, the main thing Boylan was an outstanding academic school. And uh, we felt good about our, our kids going to Boylan and getting the education, getting getting the uh, Catholicism that my wife and I had practiced. And, and at the same time, um, the challenge of going to Boylan, which had predominantly been known for at that particular time as a football school, um, Dolph Stanley, I was replacing Dolph Stanley as the head coach at uh, at Borland and Dolph had been there 10 years and he was 75 at the time when he was leaving and when he got when he retired from the public school 65 went to Borland in his first year of Borland and got to the lead eight uh he had a transfer guy come in from uh, Rockford West named Charlie Franklin who I ended up coaching his son years later and uh but anyways he he was a big rebounder and and they got to lead, but and uh, but golf, they wanted they wanted a regional and a sectional and super, and they got down to real close tough games. Everything was a tough game, and the next nine years only won one one regional, and and so the last couple of years he didn't win, win that many games, and so my first year of one, I sat with Dolph in the cafeteria. He said, um, Coach, I'll tell you what. You know, he says, you can never win. It's hard to win here in Borland. I said, why is that, coach? He says, well, you got all the Swedes on the east side, and you got all the black boys on the west side, and all we have here is these short Italians. And this is a true story. <laughs> and so I says, well, I could easily take care of that. <laughs> and so I, so we had we changed the dynamics of the of the players and at Boylan pretty quick because we opened up our doors and we went around passed down hundreds of brochures got up kids in the camp our first camp we had thirty five kids and like I said it wasn't eight or nine years later we we're going from a hundred two hundred three hundred to four four or four hundred. Kids, the girls didn't even have a camp. I ran a girls camp too for a while until I finally convinced a girls coach to take it. So it was the idea of bringing people in 
And once once you did that, that was like a community deal right there. You felt like you're part of something pretty big when you're going around to all different schools and talking about your school and talking to boys clubs and girls clubs and just passing out brochures and getting to know the people of getting the people of uh, of Rockford themselves. And they and, and, and they came and you build it, they will come. And uh, we had a we had a situation where, you know, the first year we were seven and 17. It was one of my two losing seasons in my 39 years. And uh, Father John Mitchell, you know, they later became a senior and passed, uh, called me in the office to sign my second year contract. And he said, uh, Steve, you know, you had a good year. I said, what are you talking about? We won seven Seven, something, yeah, but they only won four last year, so you really improved. <laughs> and he said, "Well, I can't handle this, Father. You know, I got spoiled down down in Quincy, and then I swear, I got spoiled." He says, "Look, better. Well, you did a good job. So next year we got to the, we got to the Sweet Sixteen. We lost a real tough game to Bed in Academy, and with this, with the kids I had that won seven games, um, most of them were none of them went on to play." any major basketball, but they're just tough, hard-nosed, great kids, and they laid the groundwork. They they believed in what I was talking about, about you one step at a time. And in fact, a, a side story, there's a, when 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 we won a game late that first year in, in um, at Boylan, I'm just in the locker room, and I, and I said to the kids, you know, it, you know, you feel good about the win, and it was a fifth or sixth win of the year or something. I just want to tell you something. You know, our first few games here, we could have shot a shotgun out in our stands and not hit anybody. And I want to tell you, if you believe in what we're doing, you work hard. I, I says yeah, those, those stands will be totally packed. Uh, when we went to, down to play uh, that Sweet 16 game, well, heck, even back up, we when we beat we beat uh, Guilford at Guilford. Uh, that that sat that section was crazy. Because the section was at Guilford, and we couldn't get we couldn't get uh, a lot of our student body couldn't get into Guilford for the game. It was it was totally sold out. Guilford would give us enough tickets. Um, we had to play Fox Lake Grant the first game, and we we're down seventeen or eighteen points at halftime. I don't even know what it was. It was pretty close to near twenty. We ended up winning by nineteen. Our halftime was just an explosion. And we didn't, we didn't, because of the fact that the last game of the regular season, and this is almost like the turning point of this whole program, because we, the team that was 7-17 now had a winning record, had a chance to tie for the, uh, I think tie for the conference championships the second year. We end up with, with replacement officials for this game at Guilford, the last Friday night of the year before the next week's the regional against Guilford, who's one of the best teams in the conference. We get some guy, a, a father and son uh, traveling show. I, it's the only time I've ever done this. A, a, a Guilford player uh, got an offensive rebound. And he dribbled, faked, and dribbled again, and went to shoot the ball. And our kid tried to stop it, and he double dribbled. Right? They didn't call it. They count the basket, count the foul on our kid, and I'm getting it. And, and the guy, the guys wouldn't even. The referees just went away from me. Okay, I chased him across the floor. Okay, I was a lot younger. I chased him across one. That's where I got the tee. And we lost the game. So after that game, that's in Guilford. Regionals are starting the next week. We lost lost any chance for the conference championship. I tell the kids, I says, look, this could be small potatoes. We, we come back here in two weeks and win the sectional championship on this floor. We, uh, we go ahead and uh, win the regional, come back. Down, down 17 or 19, we go to uh, on a diamond trap zone de tra defense the second half. They couldn't get the ball to half court. We just kept on getting forcing turnovers. My little guards, like my little guards were like 5'8", five, 5'9", five, 
five ten to three you know, Schwarzbacher is like it and Panther one one's a doctor one one's one owns a business and uh the other guy that owns a business too so they're real sharp guys and I had uh, Mike Fluker who was six eight just standing in the background and he was uh he was uh, he he actually worked for Nike when I was an engineer he went to he went down to Wash U St. Louis he was the only one to play college basketball really at D3 down there and Reslak did for one semester but he went down to Wash U got that engineering degree went to Nike and stayed still there he just retired I believe so anyways, uh, we won that one. Then we had to play Guilford that night, that, the, the championship night. We smacked them by 17. We just, we just beat them by 17. And and then we had to go to – and got beat in the Super. But we won that game. We made a point. The kids got out. They knew to come back. They, they won the game. And they pointed. And, and when we lost the, the, the game the following Tuesday, we had uh, – oh, the, the one Schwarzbach kids, interesting story – Schwartzbach kid played the last three weeks of the season with a chip on his ankle. He he refused to stop playing. I mean, it was bad enough that he had an operation after the season was over. And he's a great golfer. And he still, and I went to visit him in the hospital naturally and, and after that. And, and he, he dove for a ball in a, in a super game. He knocked it away in a, in a critical time against Bennett, Bennett Academy. And they called a foul. And they shot the free throws. We didn't get the ball. but And we didn't have our... Um, and we were without another player who stepped on the ball in the warm-ups before the Guilford Championship game, twisted his ankle, but he played the game. But then after the game, after the sectional championship, I said, elevation ice, elevation ice. He didn't do what he needed to do, and it bloomed up. So he couldn't. He, we didn't have him, our uh, power forward. We didn't have him for the uh, uh, Sweet 16 game. But that team just, just opened the door. I mean, we had... I don't know if you guys can remember, but I think Sonny, Sonny Roberts was sitting in the stands and Sonny Roberts uh, ended up going to Illinois state and playing on our 27 and one team. And Danny, Danny Jones was, was, a, was a, going to be a, it was going to freshman played at Indiana. I mean, excuse me, at Wisconsin for four years. He was sitting in the stands to watch these guys. Cause, cause when we played at Bennett Academy, I, I saw these two, fighting Titan campers in the stands, right? They went to camp. They're in there. They're going to be, I said, you're going to be out there. You're, you're next. You're next. You know, you're going to carry on this legacy. You guys. And it's going to be better than it ever was before. And there were two D1 guys sitting there. So, um, and that, that's how that stuff happens. It's, you know, like we said, if you build up, they will come. And that was the foundation. Yeah. Well, anyways, I talk too much. No, not, a, not at all. Um, as, as we move on to the, the second half of the episode and, and we wanted to touch, I know you wanted to touch on a couple of topics. We touched on one, but, you know, we wanted to touch on one topic with you is, you know, you've seen so much in the, in the 50 years, and I'm sure you've seen some things that have been added over the time that you liked. I know you talked about the four class system that you are not a fan of, but maybe what's something you've liked that they've added over the years, maybe something, uh, that you've not really liked that they've added over the years, and then maybe something you see coming in the game in the next couple of years. Well, I like the, I like the three point line. I do like the, I think it, I, I, uh, I was always a post guy. I will pound the ball inside, pound the ball inside. And, and, uh, and they they'd cover inside, but once you put the three point line up there, you had to guard the line and open up your passes inside. So it made it a better, a wide, more of a wide open game. I like that. Um, uh, I'm not a big shot clock guy, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the pros, you re, pros in the, in, the NF, in the NBA, you draft players to your needs, or you sign free agents to your needs. In college, in uh, Division One, Division Two, you go out and and you find the players you need for your system. You recruit kids for your system. In high school, generally speaking, you dance with the girl you bring. Okay. They show up. That's what you have. Let's go. Yeah. You broadcast your program all over, but if they don't come make an issue, take an issue to come over, you're not, you're not going to have, it's not like high school. You're not giving them money to come in your door. Uh, never get, we, we didn't give athletic scholarships at Borland. 
I don't know about the other private schools, but we didn't give any athletic scholarships. So if you, it only needs you got you got boil you got it's almost like D three deal where you you got need and you got academics. And that was about it. If you had asked some type of data, but you didn't get any athletic scholarships. But anyways, um, I I'm not a big fan of that shot clock because let's say you're have a have a bad team. And they're just kids just aren't that good. You might have injuries, might have illness. You got to play somebody that's good. Well, if you have a shot clock, every 35 seconds, you know they're going to get the ball one way or the other. If you don't have a shot clock, you can control your destiny a little bit if you have a good point guard and you spread Dean Smith open court. You have a chance to compete and make the other team concerned about what they have to do. They just can't, well, we're going to get the ball. We're going to run up the score. It's going to go over. I think the rules, that rule controls the small guy negatively. The guy that just, we're trying to get to keep the kids in the game. So if we get in the last two or three minutes, we're within two or three baskets, we got a chance to win. But the small guy that's got the shot clock and the, and the big team comes in, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. I mean, <laughs> a long time ago, far, far away, before you guys were born, uh, there's a school called there is a school called Alton, Alton, Illinois, and they were playing a team that I think had, I think I don't know if they ended up winning the state championship that year or not, called Collinsville. And Collinsville is Virgil Fletcher. And Alton was coached by my mentor, Cheryl Hanks, before he went to Quincy. Collinsville had beaten Cheryl during the year. Collinsville was, I don't know, ranked number one or two in the state. Cheryl didn't have the power, manpower to beat him straight up. Cheryl held the ball. Held the ball, held the ball, held the ball. You know, four to three at the end of first, some crazy thing. This is a true story. Mrs. Fletcher, God bless her, Went down and with her purse, hit Cheryl with the back in a back in his back with a purse. She says, what the hell are you trying to do to my husband? We're going to state and you're doing this crap. <laughs> Cheryl turned around, what is going on? Get this woman out of here. Well, Collins will end up winning. But Cheryl was doing what he, all he could possibly do to stay with this team. This powerhouse state team to try to all to try to beat this this team to get to, to do this. So I think you take away the uh, the chance or the mystery the mystery of the game a little bit when you put down uh, when, you, when you got a shot clock going on all the time. I don't know. Maybe I'm just old school, but I, that's how I feel. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit before, before the episode, and we know you wanted to talk about kind of the AAU high school basketball relationship um, and, and your kind of your thoughts. But, you know, like, especially especially on the girls' side, we, you know, I don't know as much on the boys' side, but, like, girls' numbers are dropping, high school numbers are dropping, but then there's more AAU clubs in every every sport. Um, so kind of – you know why do you why do you think that's the case and like how how can we find a, a balance to keep you know i mean all the tremendous stories and the experiences that you've been talking about for 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 kids today but balance their need they need to play and, and get it get exposure and and see you know get a chance to play at the next level all right Th- this is what i think you guys should do especially girls I think all girls basketball coaches should get with all girls volleyball coaches at their high schools and sit down and you don't leave the room until you're unified to do one thing. During volleyball season in the fall, you do whatever you want to do with those girls, you're the volleyball coaches. And then when the volleyball season is over, you're going to tell your girls, I want you to go out for basketball because you're going to get agility and mobility and jumping and basketball that will help you in volleyball. And you're in high school one time. You're in high school one time. 
And to be honest with there's no, and to be honest, there's more money in, in women's basketball there than there is in women's volleyball. If they're really, if they're really good players and, and all those volleyball players could not, most of them can be very good basketball players and hand in hand. And in the summertime, when they go, when, when I want them to go to the volleyball camp, no, but I want them at the basketball camp. Nobody, when you go to high school, whether male or female, you should play all sports. You, this is a four-year experience in your school. You go, you're, every day you're going to class with these kids. After school, you like play football, you basketball, you're with these kids, you socialize with them. Your parents are entitled. This is the age of entitlement. I want my I want my son to play for the Bulls. Well, BS. Your son's not playing for the Bulls. He's not playing. Okay. I you know, please face reality. And 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 the whole idea is you can't you're you're trying to buy success. Some guy just coming up there and say, You come to my you come to my program and I'll get you a guaranteed scholarship to to wherever. And well, there's only, there's very few things in life are guaranteed. And those scholarships when you're 14 years old are not guaranteed. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyways, I think we, uh, we had a, two girls in Boylan. I just left. I just retired. I'm down at the Y and working out and I see this girl and she was working out there. She's long and lean. She, and I, she, she was a boy and girl. And I says, you play basketball? He said, oh no, I play volleyball. You're a, you go to boy. And I says, yeah, yeah, I do. And she says, well, how's the team? Well, I don't play for boy. And I just play the AAU. This girl said, boy, she's just playing AAU because AAU coach said, oh, you're going to get a scholarship to Ohio State. And she was a freshman. So she she goes to Boylan four years and never plays for her high school team. She just plays for the AAU team and travels someplace to go out of the area to do this. Where's I, I can't understand it. Same a year later, Boylan again, a girl. She plays some AAU, but she also plays for her team. Plays four years for Boylan. Where does she go to school? Penn State. Where she end up one of the Penn State's all-time leading volleyball players, and I think she ended up in the Olympics. So, it, it, the high school, your high school, it, you guys know. Look, I know that when I, if your son played for me and he was good enough, who do you want? I'd ask you, where do you want to play? You want to play at North Northwestern? I'll call Chris Collins. You want to play? You want to play Wisconsin? I'll call Bull Ryan. You want to? Play at Illinois, I call Lou Henson. You want to play it? Play at Indiana, I'll call Bob Knight. I know those guys. I immersed myself. Remember, I went and traveled and went to their practices and everything. I sat there. I, I said when Tommy Crean went to Marquette, I sat there next to Hank Raymond's for God's sake and watched his practices. I immersed myself into the college game, not by working in the colleges, but knowing the guys. So if a if a kid wants to go wanted to go someplace, I'll call him. Steve Fisher and I were buddies. We coached, and when I was assistant at Crete Moni, he was assistant at Rich, Rich uh, East. I mean, I, I still got his, I got his number on my phone right now. I could call him. He's we both been out of coaching for ten years. So what I'm what I'm saying is, if you're really a good high school coach, then you build up your repertoire of college coaches that you know. And you sit down with those parents and say, look, be loyal to the school. I'm going to support your daughter, in your case, guys' cases, in any sport they want to play here in high school. But this AAU, you ask them, how much you spend for AAU and how much you think you're going to get back? Because they just don't spend money for the, the daughters to go to AAU or the sons to go to AAU. They have to get in their cars and their airplanes and fly. They want to go, they we're going to be in Florida. It's like a lark they're on. Then all of a sudden they graduate from high school, and do they actually are they actually in a better stead uh, than they would have been if they stayed with you or any other high school coach that's working for them for four years? So we have a responsibility as high school coaches to prove to the parents that the best step forward 
is depending on us to help their son or daughter accomplish their goals to be the best they could be by through our educational and athletic system. Well, yeah, coach, you actually just, I was going to follow, but you actually just hit on it because, uh, you know, I, I was going to say, I, I coached at a junior college as well, right? Very, very similar, right? Sometimes you got to get kids and you're promoting your kids. I, I think that's kind of the missing piece as well these days of of the the coaches doing doing the work for their kids, whether it's educationally, right? You want to get into a uh, a business school or uh, whatever, you know, maybe they're not going to play bas basketball, but I would even, you know, I had multiple sport athletes. I would help them send out emails for softball or, or whatever, just because it's, I just felt it was my job to get that kid one an education, right? If they can get their education paid for or get an education that they might not have an opportunity to. So I think that's kind of the missing piece as well of, you know, even in the school, right, you know, going to a school that's maybe down with numbers, going in the school and finding kids, hey, come on, play basketball, here's what I can help you with, here's how I can help you with your your other sports, so I, I think that's a tremendous, tremendous point, it's not just X's and O's to build your program, it's, you know, the camps you talked about, the finding, finding their kids, and, and, and helping, helping your kids achieve something maybe a little bit bigger that they didn't think they could, they, they could accomplish. Well, I, I do too, and I and I think that you, you, you that's why you have to have a uh, strong relationship with your fellow coaches in other sports and the administration. I mean, you, the administration shouldn't just tolerate from their from a, a coach they bring off the street to coach their volleyball team per se, and for their for them to say to the students that your school, oh, you can't play basketball, you can't play track because you because you have to play AAU all year. Oh, wait a minute, they go to, they go to, to Resur Resurrection High School to play, uh, to play uh, basketball, and then they end up playing AAU volleyball, and that coach tells them you can't play basketball Resurrection, you have to play AAU all year round. Well, if, if, that, if that AAU volleyball coach is coaching at also at Resurrection, that's that's tearing up the the school that 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 volleyball coach is working at. That's that's not that's not that's not the positive educational system. I don't think any of us really want. I want the I want the young lady to enjoy volleyball, but I still I think she want I want her to enjoy basketball. I want her to enjoy her classmates and teammates across the board. Well. Wow you're you're not going to get any disagreement from Todd or I and anything you said that's why I was giving you a round of applause in the background as you were talking but um as we move into our last two segments uh the first one we call 30 second timeout it's our guest platform to talk about any topic uh that they want it could be about family it could be about the coaching profession um it could be about something outside of of basketball outside of coaching you could turn the tables on Todd and I and ask us a question it's kind of your your thirty second uh, minute platform to uh, own the show. I, th I think we have to put the responsibility of the, our young men and women uh, progress on their backs, like I alluded to earlier, and not their parents' backs. Okay, I think we have to. Tell the parents, you brought them into this earth, you fed them, you clothed them. Now they have to prove that they're going to be ready to be responsible adults. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we did at our camps, and I know you, you even asked me, is about reading a book. Mm -hmm. And... Um, a book that I'm finishing up is unbracketed. And I don't know if you guys read this or not, but it's uh, Villanova, Gonzaga, uh, Davison, and Loyola. Four private schools that rose from middle of the pack type success in, in college basketball, you know, Loyola won a 63 state cha um, national championship. Uh, but they were they had been losing records for decades. 
into a situation where they 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 brought their their programs into prominence, and how they did that. Um, one of the things that I I noticed is that in the book is that they exposed uh, their players to various situations around them that they may not have may not have been aware of. For example, uh, uh, Davison, you know, Davison took their program to Auschwitz. Hmm. They got in a plane in the summertime and, and flew those cosplayers out to Auschwitz. And, they, and actually, when they did this, I think in 18 or not, 2018 or 19, they actually had a survivor with them. And went out there and showed them what 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 hell was or what hell is and i i think that we have to open the eyes of our families and quit this tunnel vision and and show what what it is what can we do for you what can we do for someone else what just like we you know, visiting the hospitals, that's just a sample. I mean, just the the idea of being kind to the person next to you is, is what life is all about. It's not the idea of taking from the person next to you. It's the idea of learning from the person next to you and treating each other with respect. And I, I, I think the idea that it's tough getting kids out for athletics is a sign that we are not focusing on what athletics is all about. It's not just W's and L's. It is about family. It's your family away from home. And it's it's people that could count on you. It's like, you know, I've buried too many of my players already in my life. Okay, I had one di uh, one y yesterday, uh, 30 years old, dead, shot in the head, three kids might be coming. I might, if I get through, if I, I might be coming up to Rockford, if I could drive without hacking, was coughing and <laughs> making it, but, uh, then you know, the other guys die from cancer and stuff like that. And, it's it's the idea of the love and the memories we have working together towards common goals and sharing these things that makes this whole life worth it. I mean, if, if you have everything you ever wanted, do you have anything at all? Hmm. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. I mean, I... I if you have every, if you have everything you ever wanted, then maybe everything came too easy. You don't, you don't appreciate what you really have. This idea, I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I live behind him. My dad started a business like so. My dad had a sixth grade education. For two years of my life, uh, my my mom, my dad, my my sister, and my baby brother. Well, there's. Three of them hadn't been born yet, but the, the oldest three of us, we lived behind the shop in, in, a, in a room with a partition, an eight foot ceiling, and, and a partition went up like seven foot, and there was about a foot space, and, and the other side was a shop where my dad was running printing presses, and we're living over here. We had to go next door to shower. We had just a half a bath. We had just an electric burner for two years, and, and we had, a, you know... Um, when my we we had we had to put my dog down because we had moved from the suburbs to the city. He got infested by rats, and we had to put the down, my puppy down. And I'm nine years old, you know, and to find out what how hard it is to work for for your goals and set your goals and, and go on from there. It's it, it everything isn't you know if you have everything then you. Do you have anything? I mean, that's my thing. You know, it's you gotta you gotta realize what you have and cherish it. 
and 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 thank thank God every day for what you have and 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 try to learn something every day. Even at, even at my advanced age of 112, <laughs> I, I you know it's like I'm reading this book. It's unbracketed. Well, my my our daughter just gave me a book at Christmas, which when I get done I'm done with unbracketed. Is the last folk hero, who, and who is that? The life and myth of Bo Jackson. Okay, well, I got one Bo Jackson story for. You. I don't know if you heard this or not. So, this elderly couple's out in Kansas City. They blow a tire out, turn aside the road, and it's an interstate, and they're on his shoulder. They know what they're going to do. All of a sudden, this. Car pulls up be, uh, off the road behind him. Here comes this big black guy out of the car, comes up to the car, and they don't know who it's. They look at, excuse me, I'm Bo Jackson. Can I help you? Here's a guy that's playing for the, I think it's Kansas City Chiefs at the time or summer. I never was in football, baseball. He was playing for Kansas City. And he pulls off the road, the all star. A guy, a guy we said has everything. No, he he's going to give something. He's taken, he said he didn't call people or to do it. He got out and he changed the tire for these people. A person who is a premier all-time athlete stopped to change tire for an old for an elderly couple. So they didn't they didn't know if they, they were this guy got a car, is there a problem or anything like that? No. He loves his fellow man. And I think that's what we have to do as coaches. I think, and that's what we have to convey to our to our uh, our parents, who, if if in fact, if in fact that um, we have a situation where you don't like the coach, I think we'll have to learn how to work with the coach. Instead of say, let's just get another coach or something like that. Because I because the th one of the things I know about AAU is if AAU has your son or daughter, they're always looking for another son and daughter to replace your son and daughter. They're always in because that's how they make their money and it's how they're financed by having success from the AAU team with the goods they're wearing. So is that, is that a little bit around the park there, but was that good? No, oh, that's amazing. No, that, that was, that was totally, totally awesome. I, I think that's not only a, a good lesson for coaches, but I think it's just a good lesson for people in general and in today's, today's society to, you know, think about others and not just, just yourself. Cause like you said, you just said multiple situations. You never know where people are coming from or what they've had to go through. And I think sometimes, a lot of times we assume, you know, assume that everybody is like you, you kind of have that bias of, well, everybody's from the same place as me, where we're at. And it's not necessarily the case. No, it's not. It's not. If you just look, look today's news, I mean, oh, it makes me want to cry almost. It's just so sad that we, we that we can't share our mankind today just can't share love and to get some togetherness to support the person next to you instead of, well, I I don't like your religion, so I, I need to kill you. What? Is that, is, is what God in any religion says, I got to kill you? Or I, I, you don't deserve to live or something. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be on a downer with it. I'm sorry. Well, let's uh, let's let's go to our last segment, quick hitters, fun segment. We're just gonna give you some rapid, rapid, random questions here. Uh, you know, I always say sometimes this is where the wheels fall off, but in a good way, right? We have some fun. Um, first, quick hitter question. Uh, yeah, I know you mentioned the food, right? <laughs> but the best thing about coaching in a small town, you know everybody. You know every. You feel like you're. You feel like uh, you're part of the community. You just feel like, uh, like in Harvard, we had milk days where you, where uh, we went out and did a milk run or with the cow in the counter or anything like that, and go out there and run two miles. You put you let your kids go jog along with you two miles or something like that for the milk run, and and everybody's proud of uh, Harmelda was the name of the cow <laughs> at Harvard. 
Yeah, it's still <laughs> cows, cows out there. It's in the corners. Put on <laughs> each really? there's, a, there's a, this big cow. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So maybe a maybe a funny story from when you were coaching, maybe in your very early years as an assistant. Maybe something funny that happened or something you just remember that was was a funny story. Let me see here. There's a couple of them. Uh, there's one out there. There was one I was at Boylan and um who had a I'm not gonna name the players now, actually. And there was this one player who was a good kid. And uh, he was a point guard, but he was like my second or third string point guard. And we got ahead, and, and he was always, you know, he's like, coach, I need a time, I need, I need to show you what I could do and all this stuff. Okay, he says, keep working hard, get a chance. So there was like, well, the games decided we're up, I don't know, 15 or so like that in the last minute, minute of play. And I put him in a game and uh, line up to shoot free throws. And, uh, he throws a shot at Smith. He, he jumps high in the air, gets the rebound. He puts it in for two points. Problem is, it was the other team was shooting the free throw. But, that's funny. Whoops. He, he, was ready to, he was ready to go, though, right? And I looked at and now I looked at my assistant and I says, maybe now the guy knows why he doesn't play more. <laughs> Uh, your did you have any pregame rituals as a head coach? Was there anything you did? Took a nap. I tried to take a nap. Oh, I tried. I got, got okay. home. We had we had a little walk through. We get home and try to get parallel for forty five minutes an hour if possible. If it's a home game, especially you know, I just try to get quiet myself down. Um, lay down, just relax, close my eyes, just try to just get a little bit of peace. Uh, and, and with the team, we always um, we always said "Hail Mary and the Queen of Victory" before we went, took the floor to warm up. All right, last one is kind of a fun one. I, I kind of thought about this one halfway through, but if you weren't a coach and a teacher, and you went to the army and you came back and you didn't go to to teacher college, what would you have been? Well, here's the here's the situation. I'd have been under pressure because I had. Because I was a military policeman, I was in the army, and I had one uncle that was uh, was uh, was a sergeant in the police department in Chicago, another one that was a homicide detective, I believe, in New York City, and uh, the one in Chicago was always taking me down the basement and had me work on a punching bag, and he wanted me to do that. When you get out of there, we get out of service, you don't come be, be a policeman. And it, no, I probably been, a, been a, either a policeman. I, I didn't want to go work in the printing business. I'm too much of a person, people person. And, and if you go into printing business, you're in back in the days, you're just in there. In there, I don't, I don't want that. I like being around people and talking to people and sharing things. Um, so maybe I would have been a policeman, but maybe I would have been a professor. I don't know. I got three degrees. I just didn't, didn't finish up my got a third. My third degree is in educational administration and uh, Western didn't give a doctor back then. And so uh, if I'd have continued my education, I'd have had to go to Indiana or Iowa to finish up my doctorate one year plus my dissertation, but I was so busy coaching naturally. I didn't have time to, to finish that up. So I might've got into educational administration or something or, or taught at the college level. Well, coach, uh, it has been an honor and a joy to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking your time and and uh, there's just so much knowledge and wisdom in, in in this episode that I know our our listeners will enjoy and we we appreciate your time so much well I appreciate you taking your time on a Sunday you know before a big bears victory um yeah <laughs> coming up here uh but I it's it's something I think that is very valuable because I think if you go back, uh, and Bruce Fairchild is a big, you know, history guy for the IBCA, and uh, and and he gets he tries to get some of these recordings and everything of various coaches, and 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 even like you, we when we start his whole interview, we talked about how the IBCA got found was founded, and I was at that, uh, you know, I was the third person involved 
But when we had the first board meeting, when they called all those coaches in, now you think about the coaches that were in the meeting down uh, down in central Illinois when they when they really got it going solid when they brought Ron Ferguson down and uh, and Ron Nikovich from Lagrange and and they brought uh, uh, Dottie Hawkins over from Peak and they brought Rich and Ron Heron up for, uh, down from Southern Illinois Lee Kabuti from uh, from Champaign. Uh, and Cheryl Hanks naturally and, and uh, Chuck Walensky, all these guys in this room and and that had this wealth of of coaching experience and backgrounds and stories and and for you guys to record st- things like this with, with various coaches, I think that's good because uh, once we're gone, we're gone, you know and uh, and when you do this 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 says something for the association which I'm proud to be a, a member for I don't know, 60, 70 years almost now, S- 60 years anyways, almost. So uh, God bless you guys. And I, I appreciate you taking your time. And uh, if there's anything else I could do for you, just let me know. Thank you for listening to another episode of the after the timeout podcast in partnership with the IBCA. Please be sure to rate us on whatever platform you are listening and give us a five-star rating. For more show content and updates, please follow us on Twitter at After the Time Out. As always, thank you for listening. Tune in next time for more content on the court, off the court, and anything in between.